And if you've got your copy of the Word of God, if you will find the book of Colossians. The book of Colossians. We are going to be walking through the book of Colossians over the next 13 weeks. So trust me, your Bible is just going to fall open to that pretty soon. So you might as well go ahead and get it broken in uh, to come to Colossians. We're going to begin this morning reading the introduction of Colossians, Colossians chapter 1, the first eight verses. Before we, do, before we do that, would you join me as we just ask God to speak to us personally, that this is not just a sermon, it's not just a scripture, it's not just some random speech, but it's the very Spirit of God who's looking us in the eyes saying, this is the word I have for you today. So let's give them our, our ears. Father God, we come to the scriptures with that kind of expectation. We believe them to be inspired by God and profitable. The essence of what happens over the next few minutes is not a speech that someone gives. It is the Word of God and the Holy Spirit speaking through the Word of God into our lives and into our hearts. And it's with that realization that the God who sits on the throne of all eternity has a word for me. That's the reason I give you my attention. That's the reason that we fight off distractions. It's the reason that we work to give you our ear because we do not want to miss what you might say to us. That will only happen, Father, if your Holy Spirit works among us, and so we are asking for that grace. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. So let's look at the introduction to the book of Colossians. If you want to read the same translation, I'm reading it's in your bulletin, but I hope that you'll have your Bible open before you because I want to glance at some other things in this book. Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and fellow brothers, faithful brothers in Christ in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all of the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. Just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. Colossians chapter 1. Americans are obsessed with the supernatural. Americans are obsessed with the supernatural. This was a statement by a researcher, Jeffrey Cripple. He was looking at a variety of surveys that have been taken in the recent years about this question of Americans and their view of the supernatural. Things like 80% of Americans believe in angels. 20% of Americans claim to have experienced a ghost. 14% of Americans have been to see a psychic. 75% of Americans believe in the paranormal. 40% of Americans believe that houses can be haunted. 90% of Americans who do not go to church still say they pray on a regular basis. 50% of Americans who claim they have, quote, no religion, frequent New Age bookstores. 84% of Americans say that spirituality is either very important or somewhat important in their daily life. 84%. So you see why this researcher would say Americans are obsessed with the supernatural. But what kind of supernatural are they obsessed with? Well... No greater person to answer that than the great theologian. Of course, I'm talking about the star of the TV show Buffy the Vampire Slayer, that great theologian Sarah Michelle Geller. She was asked about her spirituality, and this is what she said, and I quote, 
I consider myself a spiritual person. I believe in an idea of God, although it's my own personal ideal. I find most religions interesting. I've been to every kind of denomination, Catholic, Christian, Jewish, Buddhist. I've taken bits from everything and customized it. That last phrase is just a great statement. I've taken bits from everything and have customized it. Unless we think that interest in spirituality is just for old folks, that young folks are not interested in spirituality at all, uh, interest in spirituality among millennials is booming. One study showed that more than 50% of young adults believe that astrology is a science, not astronomy. Astronomy is a scientific study of planets and, you know, things in the atmosphere. Astrology is the belief that those planets determine events in our life. And 50% of millennials think that astrology is science. I read a, an interview with a owner of a metaphysical boutique in Brooklyn, New York, and she says that she's seen a major uptick in the interest in the occult in the past five years, especially among New Yorkers in their early 20s. Listen to this quote that came out of that article. Whether it be spell casting, tarot reading, astrology, meditation and trance, or herbalism, these traditions offer tangible ways for people to enact change in their lives. Key phrase, tangible ways to enact change in your life. She goes on. For a generation that grew up in a world of big industry, environmental destruction, large and oppressive governments, and toxic social structures, all of which seem too big to change, this can be incredibly attractive. Key phrase, all of this which seems too big to change. So this is the reality that we are in in America. Americans are obsessed with the supernatural. They're obsessed with spirituality. They are looking for tangible ways to improve their lives. They are facing problems that seem too big to solve. And so they are chasing spirituality. They are, are obsessed with spirituality, but they are unimpressed with Jesus. It's an interesting at the same time, obsessed with spirituality, yet unimpressed with Jesus. And the truth is that the more things change, the more things stay the same. What is remarkable to me is the environment in which we live, the reality in which we live, where people are obsessed with spirituality, when they are looking for some way to change their life, when they are facing problems that are too big for them to solve, and so they are chasing spirituality, that is the exact same situation that was in Colossae in the first century. It's the exact same reason the Apostle Paul wrote this letter to the Christians in Colossae. They were obsessed with spirituality. They were just unimpressed with Jesus. And because of that, the Apostle Paul writes this letter. And we're going to spend the next 13 weeks, January, February, March, walking through the book of Colossians. So I hope you like it. It's an interesting book. I think the reality of why Paul writes this book is so relevant to the world in which we live and really the, the situation in which you find yourself. That I think if we will pay attention, we will find ourselves in this letter over and over and over. So what I'd like to do this morning is introduce you to the book of Colossians. I want to introduce you to the reason why Paul wrote this book. There was, a, there was something going on in the city of Colossae, so he writes this letter. And I want you to understand that. So as we begin to walk through the book in the weeks ahead, you'll understand the significance of it, what it means, what the application is, and more importantly, what this has to do with you. What does any of this have to do with your life? So let me introduce you to and I had a letter to Colossians. So the way this comes about, Paul, the Apostle Paul, on one of his missionary journeys, is he, he's in Ephesus, and he, we read about it in Acts chapter 19, and in Ephesus, he's in Ephesus for three years. And when he's in Ephesus, he says that, that God had opened a wide door of effective ministry for him. So he had very fruitful ministry in Ephesus, and it was so effective that the word of the Lord was being known all over the region, all over Asia, Acts 19 tells us. And about 100 miles east of Ephesus is this, this town of Colossae. Now, 
Think about it, you got the DFW Metroplex, Dallas and Fort Worth and Arlington and Benbrook and all those people. And then about 100 miles to the east, we got, you know, a little bitty old Longview. I hope that didn't insult anybody. But, you know, there's a little bitty town, well, 100 miles to the east of this huge Metroplex. And that's kind of what it was like. Because when Paul gets to Ephesus, Colossae is a, an ancient city already. But it, it had its heyday hundreds of years ago. Hundred years before Colossae was this huge city, very influential, very prosperous. There were three cities there in the region, and they were all blowing and going. And when the Romans came along and they decided to build the Roman road through that region, instead of taking the road through Colossae, they took the road through Laodicea. And how many of you know of little towns in Texas that because of where the railroads went or where the interstate went, they just died on the vine? And that's really kind of what happened to Colossae. It was this great influential town, and the Roman road went through Laodicea instead of Colossae, and Colossae just started to decline and decline and decline. And by the time Paul gets to Ephesus, Colossae really is a pretty insignificant city. Of all the cities that Paul interacts with, this is by far the least significant city. So why do we even know about Colossae at all? Well, two reasons, biblically. One, the slave Onesimus, who escaped slavery in Colossae, meets the apostle Paul and is saved. And Paul writes a letter to Onesimus' owner in Colossae. That is the book of Philemon that we have in Scripture. That's one reason we know about Colossae. The other reason is because while Paul was in Ephesus, this man from Colossae comes to Ephesus, hears the gospel, is saved. Paul disciples him. He begins to work alongside Paul in Ephesus to the point that he becomes his fellow servant, and he becomes so mature and so steeped as a Christian leader that Paul sends him back to Colossae with the gospel, and Epaphras returns to Colossae with the gospel, starts the church, and becomes the church leader in Colossae. Uh, and so he was a missionary or church planner in our language today. So that's why we know about Colossae, and that's how the gospel gets to Colossae. Well, when Paul leaves Ephesus, you know, Paul goes back to Jerusalem. Paul's arrested in Jerusalem, spends two years in prison in Jerusalem. He appeals to Caesar. He takes that long voyage back to Rome. And the book of Acts ends. Paul is in prison in Rome waiting for trial. And it's when he's in prison in Rome that he writes this letter to the church, to the Christians in Colossae. And so this is about three years after uh, Epaphras has gone and taken the gospel to the city. Why does Paul write the letter? He had never been there. He never visited the people in Colossae. He didn't bring the gospel there. Why does he write this letter? Because the folks in Colossae were obsessed with spirituality. They were just unimpressed with Jesus. And so Paul writes this letter. So in this city where a city in decline, prosperity had passed it by, facing a problem that seems too big for them to solve. In this growing city, there is this growing worldview in the city. Now, you're familiar with the word worldview. Worldview is just the way in which you view the world. Everyone has a worldview, whether you have identified it and label it. You just have to answer basic questions in life. Where did everything come from? Why is everything messed, so messed up and how does it get fixed? How should we live? How should we behave? What gives life meaning? And what happens after you die? You all got to answer those basic questions, and how you answer that's your worldview. And you may call your worldview a religion. You may call it a philosophy of life. There's probably going to be some trendy word to call it in 2020, hashtag whatever, you know. So, but everyone's got a worldview of some way you answer those questions. And the worldview that was growing in popularity in Colossae was what I'm going to call today um, Chipotle Bowl spirituality. How many of y'all have been to Chipotle? Okay, a few of y'all. Okay, if you haven't been to Chipotle, it's a Mexican grill or whatever, and you start in the line, and you get your bowl, and they ask you, what do you want in your bowl? Do you want white rice, brown rice, no rice? And then you step down, do you want black beans, brown beans, no beans? Quick answer is no beans. Uh, and then you go to the meats, do you want chicken, do you want beef, you know, whatever. You go down the line, and you tell them what you want in your Chipotle bowl, and when you get to the end of the line, you've got your own personalized Chipotle bowl. And this is what was happening in Colossae when it comes to spirituality. They were taking bits and pieces from everything, and they were coming up with their own little Chipotle bowl of, of spirituality. So they were taking a little bit of Judaism, a little bit of spirituality, a little bit of mysticism, a little bit of philosophy, a little bit of asceticism, a little bit of Jesus sprinkled on top, and they were creating this kind of 
Chipotle Bowl spirituality. Now, one of the interesting things when you study Colossians is Paul never labels this false teaching. He never gives it a name. He never identifies a leader. But it's very clear that it's kind of a spirituality that's bubbling up where people are personalizing and customizing, taking different things. So as we read the letter, you'll get a picture of the Colossi Chipotle Bowl spirituality. It's got a little bit of Judaism. So they value things like circumcision, Sabbath restrictions. It's got a little bit of the supernatural, so they are worshiping the angels and spirit beings. It's got a little bit of mysticism, so they value visions and dreams and getting wisdom and, uh, for life. A little bit of asceticism and self-denial, restrictive diets. You shouldn't eat this. You shouldn't touch that. A little bit of uh, kind of modern theology. They've got this understanding of, of the divine, and, and uh, they call it eons emanating from the divine. And we'll get into that a little bit later on in this month. And on top of all that, they, had, they were sprinkling a little Jesus. Sprinkle a little Jesus on top of that, and maybe even think of that as Christianity. Here's a summary from a commentary that I read that describes what's happening in Colossae. The false teachers were appealing to spiritual beings, visions, and rules to find security in this very uncertain universe. And in doing so, they were questioning the sufficiency of Christ. Or to put that in Todd language, in a time of uncertainty where problems seemed too big to solve, The trendy way of thinking was to look to various forms of spirituality to find hope and security and to bring about change in one's life. Jesus and Scripture might be a part of that spirituality, but Jesus was not the end of it. Jesus was not even the main part of it. They were obsessed with spirituality. They were just unimpressed with Jesus. And so Paul writes this letter. Now, you're going to read the letter, and you're going to hear terms like mystery and fullness and elementary spirits of the cosmos, and these are all phrases that we don't use today, and so we're tempted to read it and say, well, this doesn't have anything to do with me, but when you understand the essence behind it, it's exactly the situation that we are in. You and I know what it is like to live in uncertain times. I mean, this past week, in our own neighborhood, we had a church shooting. This past week, we, are we going to war with Iran? We don't know. Uh, uncertain times. We know what it's like to be facing problems that seem larger than we can solve. We know what it's like to be hungering and craving for something that's going to change our life and touch us on the inside. We understand that, and we understand what it is like to live in kind of a Chipotle bowl spirituality world. You know, take a little bit of Jesus, not too much, but a little bit. But we should take a little bit of the teachings of Islam because we want to be inclusive. We should add some mysticism of Hinduism because there may be some other God that we like even more. We don't even know yet. Uh, Add some spirituality, the New Age stuff, crystals, meditation, herbs, whatever you like. Toss in some health, wealth, prosperity gospel because let's face it, we like the power of positive thinking and we all want to be rich. Uh, Add some liberal sexual ethic because we don't want anyone to tell us what we can and cannot do with our body and put a big dollop of tolerance on top because, you know, we don't want to tell anyone else that they're wrong and maybe sprinkle a little Jesus and you have your own Chipotle spirituality bowl. This is the world in which we live. And this is why Paul writes this letter. They were obsessed with spirituality. They were just unimpressed with Jesus. So we're subtitling this series, or titling this series, The Right Side of Mystery. The Right Side of Mystery. Now, obviously, we're playing off the word, the right side of history. You've heard that phrase before. The right side of history says we want to take a position on an issue that 100 years from now, history will view us that we were right, right? We want to be on the right side of history, but as believers, we take an eternal view of history. We want to take a view, a position on uh, issues that 600 million years from now that God's going to be approval of, right? Or as John Piper says, freedom is the freedom is the ability to do whatever you want and not regret it 1,000 years from now. We're just living in the light of eternity. When you live in the light of eternity, being on the right side of history takes on a whole different meaning, and which is why Paul talks about the hope that is laid up for you in heaven. And when you understand the hope that's laid up in you in heaven, it trickles down to the faith that you have in Jesus now and the love that you have for the saints in the today because you want to be on the right side of eternal 
history. But we're also playing off of the idea of mystery. We want to be on the right side of mystery. And mystery is a word you're going to come across in the book of Colossians quite a bit because mystery was an important word to the Colossi, Chipotle, spirituality bowl kind of thing. And yet Paul is not talking about the mysteries that you discern through visions or dreams or self-denial. He talks about the mystery of the gospel, which is Christ in you. The hope of glory. That's the great phrase that comes out of Colossians. That's the mystery he points us to. But the reality is we want a bit of mystery. Don't you want there to be something more to your life than just what you can see and touch and is in this world? Don't you want there to be some mystery? We need there to be some power that is greater than ourselves. We just want to be on the right side of mystery. We want to understand the right who is that that we are trusting in that is going to deliver us uh, from our day to day. So we want to be on the right side of mystery. And what is interesting is Paul writes this letter, how he addresses the issue. He doesn't come right out of the gate and say, look, guys, there's this spirituality in Colossians that is just so messed up. You need to, you need to reject it and believe in Jesus. Amen. The end. That's not what he does. First thing he does, we'll, we'll read next week, is he, he prays for the church. And when he prays for the church, he prays that God the Father would supply everything that the world around them was trying to find in spirituality. And so he prays that God would fill you with all wisdom and knowledge and understanding. He prays that God would cause you to bear fruit in every good work. He prays that God would give you uh, strength and, and power according to his glorious might in your inner being. And he prays that you would be filled with joy. In other words, everything that the world around you is looking for and all this spirituality, God the Father is the one who can supply that. And so he prays that God the Father would meet those needs. Then after that, he talks about the beauty and greatness of Jesus. If you've got your Bibles open, looking at Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. This is the greatest paragraph about the person of Jesus probably in all of Scripture. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile, reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. That's the greatest paragraph about the supremacy of Jesus in all of the New Testament. And Paul writes that before he even starts talking about this Chipotle spirituality, as if to say, Jesus, the Jesus that you're sprinkling on top of your bowl is not the real Jesus. If you meet the real Jesus, your little bowl does not contain the real Jesus. And if you realize the real Jesus is above every spiritual being, why would you be chasing other forms of spirituality? Why would you be obsessed with spirituality and unimpressed with Jesus if you knew the real Jesus? Then at the end of chapter 1, he talks about this great mystery, which is Christ in us. If this paragraph about Jesus is true, and the mystery of the gospel of that Jesus can be in you, how incredible is that? That the God who is the creator and sustainer of all things, who holds all things together, is actually the Christ that is in you. If you knew that, if you understood that, why would you be looking to other sources of spirituality when you come across a problem in your life? That's Paul's point. Finally, he gets to chapter 2, and that's where he begins to actually address this Chipotle Bowl spirituality of Colossae. He begins to address specific things and point it to the gospel and how the gospel uh, fulfills the hopes and the longings that are there. Chapter 3 encourages them to live out the gospel, right? Set your mind on things above, not on things below. Put to death what is earthly within you. Put on the new self. Love each other the way Christ loved the church. You live out the gospel. And then chapter 4, he's got some final words of closing, instructions, some final greetings. And we're going to walk through that uh, uh, piece by piece over the weeks to come. So this morning uh, was not really kind of a, a traditional where we walk through a passage of Scripture and look at it word for word. I just want to introduce to you the reason that Paul wrote Colossians but let me end that with, with this question for you, because this is, the, this is the hidden question behind the book of Colossians, the entire book. And here's the question. Is Christ sufficient for you today?
Is Jesus enough for you today? So that's the question. Whatever you're struggling with, whatever crisis or trial or whatever in your life that you're facing come Monday morning, is Jesus enough? Or will you look at the crisis and say, well, well Jesus could help some, but Jesus is not going to be the full answer to that. I, I need to add something. And if you're adding something to Jesus, what are you going to add that is greater than Jesus? Do you remember, uh, it's in the Gospel of John, Jesus feeds the 5,000, I think it's John chapter 6, and then after the feeding of the 5,000, he goes on this like 66-verse sermon, uh, and the crowd hears what Jesus is saying, and they're like, we can't follow you, you're crazy. You know, Jesus talks about eating his flesh and having life and all that kind of stuff, and so the crowd leaves. And so uh, I think it's Peter says to Jesus, Jesus, these are kind of hard words to hear. And Peter, Jesus looks at Peter and says, well, do you want to leave also? And Peter says, where else would we go? You alone have words of life. What you're saying to us is hard to hear, but where else are we going to go? You alone have words of life. Look, I, when you make the confession that Jesus is sufficient, that is not some magic spiritual wand that makes all your problems go away. That, that's not the testimony of my life, and it's not the testimony of Scripture. I mean, that's why you read Scripture. And how many Psalms begin with the phrase, How long, O Lord? And what do we read Psalm 61? When my heart is overwhelmed, I will cry out to you. Well, why is our heart overwhelmed? If, shouldn't we always be whelmed? I don't know. What's the opposite of overwhelmed? Shouldn't, we, shouldn't everything always be okay? Why do we ever get overwhelmed? And the Apostle Paul, who wrote this letter from prison. I mean, he knows tribulation, knows struggle, knows persecution. And if you read any biography of any Christian saint over the last 2,000 years, almost every single one of them will testify of a desert experience of their life where they walked through a time where it felt like God was absent and they were distant from God. So just because you say Christ is sufficient does not mean all your problems magically go away. But when you are saying Christ is sufficient, what you are saying is Jesus is the highest hope that I have. There's no other source that can do more than Jesus. Jesus is higher than religious activity and trying to be good and going to church enough. Jesus is higher than angels or spirit guides or guardian angels. Jesus is higher than dreams or visions. Jesus is higher than self-denial or rules or some kind of life plan that some life coach gave you. Jesus is higher than stars or planets or whatever. Jesus is the greatest source and the highest hope for whatever it is that you're walking through. And this is what Paul is saying. When you look at the beauty and the greatness of Jesus, why would you be tempted to go somewhere else? So I ask you again, is Jesus sufficient for you? I mean, most of us are going to walk out of this room. I mean, the reason you're here, I mean, someone may have tricked you into being here this morning, I don't know, but more likely than not, the reason you're here is because you identify as a follower of Jesus Christ. And so you're not going to walk out of this room and say, I'm abandoning Jesus. But every one of us are going to wake up on Monday morning and the crisis is going to hit. And that question's sitting there. Is Jesus enough? Or, or do I need to be adding something to Jesus that can do something that Jesus can't do? Or is Jesus sufficient? And if you say Jesus is insufficient, where, where are you going? How do you look at the one who created all things? the one who created things visible, invisible, dominions, rulers, and authorities, the one for whom all things were created, the one who is before all things, the one who holds all things together, the one who is preeminent of all things. How do you look at that Jesus and say, I don't think you're enough. I need to add something to you that you cannot do. To a world that is obsessed with spirituality and unimpressed with Jesus the Word of God calls us to be obsessed with Jesus and unimpressed with spirituality. And that's what Colossians wants us to do. Instead of 
being obsessed with spirituality and unimpressed with Jesus to be obsessed with Jesus and unimpressed with spirituality. In essence, Psalm 61, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Believing there is a rock that is the highest rock. There is no rock that is higher. Christ alone is sufficient. Would you pray with me?